right, now, um, you probably wouldn't get this from, from John chapter 1, but um, what the subject I'll be preaching on tonight is, is actually we're going to be focusing on the Apostle Peter. Okay, Peter is a main character in the Bible, and we're going to be doing this from time to time. I'm going to be focusing in on, on one specific character in the Bible, and we're really going to, going to look at their life and look at a lot of things that they did and just kind of examine it because there's a lot of things that we can learn. Peter is an extremely interesting character in the Bible, and he's got a lot of positive attributes, but he also had a few, you know, I don't know if called personality flaws, but he had a few, a few flaws too, I mean, like all of us do. So hopefully we'll be able to learn from studying his life and learn about a lot of the good things that he did that maybe we can use and, and, and improve our lives on the good things that he did and also look at, at maybe some of the aspects that, that he was not as proficient with and um, you know, kind of see what he was doing and, and use that to, um, to improve ourselves as well. So we're going to be spending the, the vast majority of our time tonight, though, looking at the four accounts of the gospel, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's where most of the stories happen that, that Peter is participating in. Um, I know, you know the Apostle Peter also is responsible for penning down the books of First and Second Peter, those epistles. And he also, there's a lot in the book of Acts about Peter. But just for sake of time, I mean, I've found so much content that we're going to study his life that we're going to just kind of stick to the Gospels. And um, the first thing that I want to point out is that Peter was a fisherman. Okay, Peter was a regular blue-collar worker. He was a fisherman. He, he, you know, he toiled by, by bringing a fish, and that's what he did for his job. And um, you know, as we saw in Acts chapter 4, if you're here for that, you know, he was an unlearned man. He was not some scholar. He was not some highly educated person in the, in the minds of, of the people of the world. He was a regular guy, a fisherman. Now, each of the four Gospels give an account of Peter becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. And this is what we see here in John chapter 1. This is what we'll be focusing on here. Now, Matthew chapter 4 and Mark chapter 1 both give an account of, of Jesus coming and basically calling unto Peter, calling unto some other disciples and telling them to follow him. And they give pretty much the same story, but we get a lot more information in Luke chapter 5 and in John chapter 1. So, and, and uh, as we go into this, this is something to help you. If you want to, it's one thing to read the Bible. And the first thing you ought to do if you've never read the Bible is read the Bible. Read it through cover to cover. The more you read the Bible, though, the more you're comfortable with it and you've read it already, the next step is going to be to start studying the Bible. And a really, really good way to do that is, is you look for things because you always want to compare Scripture with Scripture. The more you, you know, if you want to learn about the Bible and about different things, Compare different sections that are talking about the same things, that talk about the same subjects, and look up. And then, you know, that's part of what I do as a pastor. Is you know, I'm studying the Bible, and I'm looking and saying, okay, this is dealing with the same thing. This is dealing with the same thing. This, and I'm going to try to put it all together for you. But also in your own personal time, it's a good thing and a good habit to to pick a, a subject or whatever. I mean, whatever it is you want to do, study the Bible in that way. Now, the four Gospels are great. If there's something you're having a hard time understanding, try to find where, where that same thing happens in one of the other books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because they all have a, now, they all have a slightly different perspective on it. You get a little bit more information on one versus another. They kind of reveal different details. And the, the cool thing is, is that there's no contradictions at all. You, you could read it, and it's like, oh, man, I didn't even know that. This is like all this extra information, extra content. And we're going to see a little bit of that right now because, and this kind of blew me away. I never really studied so in depth on, on the Apostle Peter, but I learned a lot when I was, when I was preparing for the sermon. And um, so let's look at John chapter 1 where we st first started reading there, okay? We're going to look at verse number 35 because even this, I, I kind of, it, it totally it passed me up every time I've ever read the Bible. I never really understood this. But it's pretty cool. Um, in verse number 35 of John chapter 1, it says, Again, the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. So here we got, we have John the Baptist. So it says John there. It's talking about John the Baptist. Right? <coughs> John the Baptist came preaching and teaching before Jesus Christ came and started his ministry. 
John the Baptist was the one who was supposed to prepare the way of the Lord. So he was getting people ready. He's preaching about Jesus Christ. He's saying, okay, you know, like, like we need to get ready. Christ is coming. And he knew Christ was coming. So he's out preaching. He's out baptizing. He's doing his ministry. Jesus comes, right? Jesus gets baptized of John the Baptist. So John had a bunch of disciples and followers of him, right? There's a lot of people that were, I guess you could say, part of John's church, right? John the Baptist. And, and they were following with him. And what his job was, he was trying to point people to Jesus. Because Jesus, obviously, is a Christ. He was way better than John. So he's saying, look, in verse 36, behold the Lamb of God, saying, behold, meaning like, look at him. He's right there. Like, there's the Lamb of God. So it says in verse 37, and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So they say, okay, oh, that's the Lamb of God. Okay, well, we're going to go follow him then. Right? Of course. That's what you should do. Follow Jesus. Verse 38 says, Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And it says in verse 40, one of, the two disciples, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So, you know, in the beginning of this, where we started reading 35, it just says two of John the Baptist's disciples. Well, now we get a name for one of them. One of those two disciples that, that, that was a disciple of John the Baptist that started following Jesus was Andrew. Now, Andrew was the, was the brother of Simon Peter. It's the Apostle Peter, who we're studying tonight. Okay? And in verse 41, it says... He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. So right away here we see, you know, Andrew is pointed to Jesus by John the Baptist. He goes, he spends some time with Jesus. You know, he gets to know him a little bit. He, so, you know, ask him where he lives. Jesus, you know, brings him. Okay, I'll show you. Spends some time with him. And then the, the first thing he does, he goes, hey, I need to go get my brother. I'm going to bring my brother to Jesus. And this is great. I mean, like, first Andrew finds Jesus, and he's following him. And he's like, I'm going to go get my brother. And he brings his brother Simon to Jesus. And we see right here in verse 42, this is where Jesus actually gives Simon, because that was the, the apostle Peter's name, he gives him his new name, and he calls it Cephas. So, one thing to remember when you're reading through the Bible, if you ever see the name Cephas or Simon and Peter, it's all the same person, <laughs> generally speaking. I, mean, I don't want to say just in every single instance, but Cephas definitely, and um, there are a couple other Simons in the Bible, but, but Simon, Peter, or Peter is all talking about the same person. So, um, and the reason why he's, he has named Peter and Cephas, basically Cephas and Peter both mean a stone. It's just different languages. So they're just recording that that's his name in one language versus another language. Um, not a big deal. Okay, so we see here in John chapter 1, between all the four Gospels, I think this is what happens first. This is in, in, as far as chronology goes, as far as time goes. Because obviously when you're reading the Bible, you read Matthew first and Mark and Luke and John. But what happens, these events in John chapter 1, I think, happens first in Peter's life, um, where Peter is brought to Jesus by Andrew, his brother. And we're going to get some more information now. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter number 5. Because here we just see where, basically, Andrew introduces Peter to Jesus, and Jesus gives him his name. Luke chapter number 5. There's one, one book back in the Bible, right before John is Luke. Now we're going to read this account of... Jesus Christ with Peter. Now this, what we just saw in John, that's only in John. Like that, that section where um, he gives Peter that name and um, Andrew brings him to Jesus. That's only in the book of John. Now um, Luke chapter number 5, look at verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. 
And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Now, this is interesting too, because I remember when reading the Bible, I just kind of think like, man, that's kind of weird. Like, Jesus just walks onto this guy's boat that he like doesn't even know. Because you got, you got to get what's happening here. So what, basically what's happening is that a lot of people, says the people trust upon him to hear the word of God. Jesus was teaching. And there were a lot of people following him and listening and just want to know what Jesus had to say. So he's walking by and he's by this lake. He's by the lake of Nazareth. And he's teaching these people, but they're really kind of, they're crowding him. And there's not a lot of room for him to preach. So he gets up on one of these boats and, he, and, and it was Simon's boat, Simon Peter. And he asks him, hey, can you, can you push off from land a little bit? Just, just get me out in the water a little bit. Because then he's got his whole audience on the shore, right? And it makes sense that he could preach from this boat on the sea and it kind of carry his voice and everyone could hear him and everyone could see him and they could learn, right? So it kind of makes sense for where he was at, especially having such a great multitude. It made a lot of sense for him to do this. And I always thought it was a little funny, again, like reading this, in my mind, I'm just thinking like, it is kind of strange. Like he's just teaching and he just walks on this guy's boat and then it says, hey, hey, can you just push off? For He's probably thinking like, uh, okay, you know, whatever. <laughs> But I think in the context, especially like at John 1, I think Peter already knew who Jesus, I think he was already introduced to Peter. I think, I think Peter was introduced to Jesus Christ um, from Andrew's brother um, before this even happened. So Jesus was walking up and said, oh, okay, there's Peter. I'm going to get on his boat and ask him to, to do this for me, which, again, I mean, that's not some mind-blowing thing, but it's just kind of interesting. It's, for me, it was interesting from the way that I had read it all my life. And... Um, so he teaches the people, then he tells, and then he tells Peter, he says, okay, you know, now go out, go out into the deep. So before they were just kind of hanging out by shore, he's like, now, now go out a little bit farther and, um, and let down your nets for a draft. So he's saying, you know, because they're a fisherman, he's saying, okay, I want you to let down your nets now. And Simon answers him in verse 5, he says, and Simon answering said, unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. He said, look, we worked all night. We were out fishing all night, and we didn't get anything. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Now, notice what he said there. Jesus said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. Nets, plural. Peter's like, all right, look, we've been working all night, Jesus. I'll go at your word. I'll, I'll go. I'll let down the net. And look what happens. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Now, if he would have let down the nets, I don't think they would have broke. But because he let down the net, hey, man, and Jesus told him, like, look, let down the nets. He knew what was going to happen. But, you know, Peter's like, okay, you know, just, just to humor you, we'll go throw a net down. And their net break, it says they enclose a great multitude of fishes in that break, and they beckon unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And this is also where we, where we find out that... Um, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they were partners with Peter. So like they all knew each other beforehand. And, and of course, James and John also become disciples of Jesus Christ. So Peter, James, and John are also known as the top three where you get, the, get into that a little bit. They're kind of like, like Jesus' top disciples, the people who like follow him closely and that you hear about the most in the Bible. And they got to do some extra special things that, that none of the other disciples got to do. But they were all partners here in their fishing business. And... Um, We see that when they snag all of those fish, right? I think Peter realizes that he didn't do, for one, he didn't quite do exactly what Jesus asked him to do. And we saw that they broke. And he humbly falls down at Jesus' feet. And he says in, um, in verse 8, it says, When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. So we see right away, this, and this is kind of a, an attribute of Peter that's pretty good. He had, he had a humble attitude. 
he saw this and he's just like, okay, look, you know, I'm a sinner. I didn't, you know, I didn't listen to what you said. I should have listened to what you said. He falls out at Jesus Pete. But but one thing he does here that that I don't like, I don't think he probably should have done, is he said, um, I mean, it's good for him to be humble and fall down at Jesus' knees, but he says, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. Now, think about it, right? What he was doing right there, he's asking Jesus to depart from him. And I don't think any of us should do that. I don't think any of us should be asking Jesus to depart from him. Now, I could understand. I could see where he's coming from. I mean, you might be ashamed or embarrassed. Maybe you commit a sin, you do something wrong, and you know what? I don't even want you to look at me, Jesus. You know, like, I'm just a sinful, you just need to get away from me because you're holy, you're a great person, I'm not, just, you just shouldn't even be here. But I could see where you could have that attitude, and I'm not saying that's a bad attitude to have, but we ought to be careful. I mean, you don't want to be pushing Jesus away at the same time. I mean, you need Jesus when you have problems or whatever. Don't go, you know, kind of saying, hey, we, uh, you know, I, I, just depart from me. You never want to say, depart from me, Lord Jesus, right? So this is an attribute of Peter that we're going to see, I think, throughout many of the other stories that we're going to look at. He has a tendency to speak and act a little quickly. He kind of responds real fast to the situations that he's in. And, and, and he'll have a tendency to open up his mouth and speak a little bit too quickly, in my opinion. Now, he's got a great heart. Peter's got an awesome heart. He's got this heart, and he's just, I mean, he's, he's really to serve God. And he's kind of real um, all in and real gung-ho with what he does. And, you, and we're going to see that in, in many other aspects, which is why another reason why he's a pretty cool uh, person to study. But um, he, he has a tendency to speak quickly, and, and he has a tendency to be a little bit impulsive with his actions. So we're going to see a little bit more of that here. Now we're going, to, we're going to look at the accounts given in Matthew and Mark. And I'll just read them for you. I'm going to turn there. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Now that's a lot shorter than all the other detail that we, we've gotten to this point, if you notice that. He says nothing about him going and teaching and you know and dragging up all the other fish and doing all this other stuff. Um, it's, it's real quick and to the point. Mark is the same thing. Mark chapter 1 says, Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Now, it's important to note this, again, I kind of brought up a little bit in the beginning when we studied the Bible. None of these accounts are contradictory to one or the other. Now, they don't all necessarily include the same information, but it's not false or inaccurate or anything like that. Matthew and Mark, it's pretty quick and to the point. They just skip over a lot of the stuff that happened, but they go into more detail with other events and other things that happened. I mean, you can't give every single piece of information in every single account of the gospel, otherwise there would be no point of having different ones. But um, they're not contradictory whatsoever, but we learn a lot more when we study them from all these different angles, and you can see what they're, what they're doing. And the different information is provided in these different accounts, I think, because they're trying to, to focus on different things and teach us different things. So what we see here in Matthew and Mark is that it was important to just show that like, when Jesus said, because they're, they're out there, they're working, they're fishers, Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. It says, And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Straightway. That just means right away. Jesus called, and they responded. Jesus said, Hey, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. They said, Done. Let's do it. And I think it's, it's repeated in both of those accounts because it's showing us one. I mean, that's trying to teach us a little bit something different than the extra details teach. This is teaching us, look, when Jesus calls you, you should just go. Just do it. When he, when he asks you to do something, he wants you to follow him, hey, straightway, forsake your nets, forsake your job, whatever, whatever it is you got to do, whatever it is that he's asking you to do, and you follow him. <clears throat> whatever it requires you to do to follow Jesus, just follow him. Don't worry about it. And I think that's what's being taught here in these accounts. Whereas in Luke, and it's in the account in Luke where, uh, where it talks about him, telling him let down their nets, that's going to be really important information later. We're going to see when we get to John 21. Um, because that's almost that same exact scenario is going to come up again. 
And um, it's, a, it's amazing how the Bible just works together in, in all these different facets and across the Gospels and across the different books. I really hope you, you follow this because it's going to blow you away when you, when you just kind of get the whole picture of everything. Um, in John chapter 1, we saw that, that I believe that Andrew was already, you know, he was already a disciple of John the Baptist and he leads his brother Peter to Christ and Peter answers the call to follow Jesus then. And he's, and he, and he, you know, um, he's introduced to them. Jesus comes. He, uh, he gets on his ship and then and tells them, okay, look, I want you to follow me. You're going to be a fisher of men. And he, and he does. And um, it's also important to note, too, before we get off of this story, we're going to something else. You go ahead and turn to... Um, I don't really have to turn any more just yet. Before we get off of this point, though, Jesus Christ said, uh, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And I think this stands for us today, too. He wasn't just, I mean, he was saying that to, to Peter and James and John when he was asking them to follow him. But if you follow Jesus Christ, if you become a disciple, if you decide you want to follow him, he says, I will make you fishers of men. He will make a soul winner out of you. If you decide to follow Jesus, you want to follow through, he'll make you to go out and catch men and to, and to, and to bring men into to Jesus and to, and to direct them to Christ. But you have to follow him. But, he's, but Jesus is going to be the one that's going to do that. He'll make that for you. He'll make that happen. He'll make the change in your life. He'll, he'll make you to be able to do that, but it's up to you to follow him. It's up to you to do your part. And, um, and that's, that's reassuring. And he says he will do that for us. Now, um, Another aspect of Peter we see in, in you know, if you turn to Matthew 8, 14, says that when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. Peter was married. Peter had a wife. And that's something you don't hear much of at all because Peter basically left and was following Jesus all over and doing the stuff that he was doing. But um, it's, it's, also, it's important to note this because there's a false religion out there called the Catholic Church that teaches that, Je that Peter was the first pope. And of course, they have all their rules for the for the popes and for their religious leaders that they they have to be celibate; they can't be married. Well, they're very if they are going to call Peter their first pope, their first pope was married, because it says in Matthew eight fourteen it says, and when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of the fever. Peter's wife's mother's mother in law was sick when Jesus Christ came in. Jesus, of course, Jesus healed her, and she gets up and ministers unto him, but. Um, Peter was married. And it's, it's a small detail. It's, you know, not the biggest thing in the world, but it's, it's an aspect of Peter's life, and it, and it shows that, look, Peter was not the first pope, and it's, um, it's one of these false doctrines. I mean, people try to tell you that, oh, if you're going to be an apostle, if you're going to be a, a man of God or whatever, and, and it's, it's just totally distorted and totally a lie when the Bible actually says the exact opposite, that you're supposed to be, the bishop's supposed to be the husband or the the husband of one wife. Yes, I did get that right. <laughs> I don't want to say the wife of one husband. But the bishop is supposed to be the husband of one wife, and that is part of the requirements laid out for the pastor, for the for the bishop, and for the deacon, that you need to be married. Whereas the Catholic Church now is saying, well, no, they can't be married. They, 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 they're not allowed to be married. It's just completely contradictory to Scripture. Now, one thing you'll notice about the... Um, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier with the disciples, that Jesus seemed to have a top three in, in Peter, James, and John. In many places, we're looking at a few of them right now, where they get access to these special events and see special things that the rest of the disciples just didn't get to do. In Luke 8, 51, the Bible reads, And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John, and the father and mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. This is a miracle that Jesus Christ did on, on a young girl where he brings her back to life. She actually died, and Jesus he brings her back to life from the dead. And everyone else, he didn't, sell, he didn't allow them to go into the house. He said, nope, nope, none of you guys can come in here. Of course, the mother and father were in there. But he did allow Peter and James and John also to be in there to witness this miraculous event. So that was one cool thing that they got to be a part of that no one else did. Mark 9, 2 says, And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, 
and he was transfigured before them. This is a cool event too. Again, he takes just those three and they go into a mountain. And what it means when it says Jesus was transfigured, at that moment, Jesus Christ was in his glorified body. So you and I today, we're in, we're in bodies of flesh. Jesus Christ was in a body of flesh and blood when he was walking around on this earth. One day, at the resurrection, we are going to get a new body. We are going to be transfigured. We're going to get a brand new body. It's not going to be flesh and blood like we have now. It's going to be a slightly different body. It's going to be one where we don't have aches and pains. It's going to be a perfect body. It's not going to have the sinful lustly, you know, lusts of the flesh. It's going to be a perfect body. And we're going to receive that. Now, Peter, James, and John, they got to see, they got to behold this vision of Jesus Christ in his glorified state, transfigured into his new body. Which again, is, it was something really cool, and, and they didn't even understand it at the time what you know what they were witnessing, but they got to see that. And then also in the Garden of Gethsemane, if you remember, right before Jesus was crucified, he went into the garden, and and he was real heavy, and that's where he prayed to God and was real sorrowful, and I mean he was really just going through agony because he knew that his hour was come, he knew he was going to be delivered up, and he would have to suffer all the things that he suffered that we talked about in another sermon where. You know, just the pain and the agony and suffering that he went through for us. But he, right before all that stuff happened, he went into this place in this garden, and he brought with them. It says in Mark uh, or Matthew twenty six thirty seven says, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. So the people that he wanted with him in that hour of trouble and his time of need, those top three again. Throughout the Bible, you'll see that in the New Testament that. Um, they were, they were special people. And Pete, so Peter was a special person. He was special to Jesus Christ. He was, he was kind of seen as one of, one of the main people, the, one of the main followers of Christ. Now we're going to look a little bit more, a little bit more into his impulsiveness. Go ahead and turn to, um, turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're spending a lot of time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'll just keep you in Matthew for a while. Most of the verses that we're looking at are going to be in Matthew, so... Anytime we turn to Matthew, you go ahead and flip there, and I'll read the rest of them for you. Matthew 14, we're going to see a story here. And this is a really neat story. This is a really cool story about, about what Peter does here. Matthew 14, we're going to start reading in verse number 25. It says, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He, and he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, this is really cool. This is where we see Jesus Christ is walking out of the water. He's walking out into the middle, just in the middle of this lake. They're on the boat, and they get scared. They get freaked out because they, they see this guy walking out of the water. They're thinking, like, is that a ghost? Is that a spirit? Like, like what is that? Well, Jesus realizes this, and he's like, okay, look, don't be, don't be afraid. It's just me, right? It's, it's Jesus. I'm here. And so Peter, Peter pipes up, and he's thinking, okay, Jesus, if it's really you, Call me out there to you. Because he knows Jesus is going is to lead him astray. So he said, if it's really you, Jesus, bid me to come out there with you. And he does. He says, come. So Peter, I mean, that takes a lot of boldness. And, and just, I mean, think about that. Like, even if this crosses his mind, it's just, I think it's one of the things I love about Peter. He's just like, it came across his mind. He says, him, hey, you're walking out in the water. I want to walk out there on the water with you. Call me out there to you. And he did. And he, start, and he starts walking on the water. Peter is the only apostle that got to walk on the water with Jesus Christ. Now, of course, he got a little scared because there was like waves and stuff around him. He looked at it and it's like, whoa. Like, <laughs> and he began to sink. But Peter got the chance to walk on water. That took a little bit of impulse. A little bit of, you know, he was thinking like, but his heart was in the right place. I mean, he, was looking at, he was looking at Christ and saying, hey, if you tell me to do this, I'll do it. If you call me out, I'll do it. And I think that's really cool. Another uh, story about, about Peter here and a little bit of how he's got a little bit of an impulse. Not necessarily always bad. I mean, there's nothing wrong or bad with what he did there. It was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty neat that he was able to do that. John chapter 18, verse 10 says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it 
and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheep. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So here we see that's right when they come to arrest Jesus Christ. They come to arrest Jesus, and again, Peter, James, and John were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And they come, and they, they have all these swords and spears and stuff, and they come to take him. And Judas led him, of course, was the traitor, and betrayed Jesus Christ. They come to arrest Jesus, and Peter's just like, boom, he pulls out his sword, and he swipes it and, and cuts a guy's ear off. And um, again, not saying that that's bad, but Jesus said, to him, okay, look, you know, we're not, we're not fighting with swords right now. You've got to put up your, your sword. There's a reason why he's going through this. And there's a reason why he has to do this. So, you know, he kind of tells him to back off. But, hey, Peter was the first one. He's just like, boom, I'm right there. I'm going to defend Jesus Christ. You know, I'm going to, I'm right here. He was, he was being solid there. But, but it was impulse. I mean, he was just like, boom, I'm ready to go. And then in um, John chapter 13, verse 6, I'll read this for you as well. Go ahead and turn to Matthew 16 if you're still in Matthew it's, the Bible reads, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? This is at the Last Supper where we see, um, you know, Jesus humbles himself, and he gets down, and he decides to wash all the disciples' feet. And then when he gets to Peter, Peter just asks him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou, what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. So Jesus already said, Look, you don't know what I'm doing now. you understand it later. But, but Peter kind of answers pretty quickly. And, and again, we've seen this before. Then Peter answers real quick. He says, thou shalt never wash my feet. Don't, you know, don't say depart from me, Jesus. Don't, when Jesus is about to wash your feet, wash everyone else's. And Jesus says, look, you don't understand this right now, what I'm doing. Don't tell him, never wash my feet. He's doing it for a reason. Jesus answered him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. So then we see the exact opposite. Peter says, uh, Simon Peter says unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Like, oh, if that's the case, then wash me everywhere. You know, I don't want to be missing out at all. But this is kind of like the way Peter acted. This, is, this gives us a little bit about the personality of Peter and how he was just, I mean, he really, with all of his heart, was kind of, you know, one way or the other, and that's the way he went. And if you're in Matthew 16, look at verse number 21. It says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So he's explaining to him, look, I'm going to have to be killed and the resurrection is going to happen. This is what's going to happen. Then in verse 22, it says, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Again, he's saying these things, all these stuff that he's saying, he's got a good heart, right? I mean, we tell... Jesus, to depart from me, I'm a sinful man. He's got a good heart. When he tells Jesus, you know, not to wash his feet, he's thinking, Jesus, you shouldn't be washing my feet, I'm a sinner. You know, like, he's looking at it from that perspective. And when he says here, you know, oh, be it far from me. No, you're not going to be killed and, and be crucified and all that stuff. Like, that's not going to happen to you. His heart's in the right place. But look at what, what Jesus says to him in verse 23. He says, but he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Obviously, Peter should not have said that and rebuked Jesus Christ the way that he did. It was wrong for him to do that. But And you can see why also, I mean, if your heart, your heart can be in the right place, but it doesn't mean you always do the right things. And Peter, Peter's heart may have been in the right place, but he shouldn't have done that. And he shouldn't have spoke that way. And we ought to be careful with the words that come out of our mouth. We ought to be careful not to react too quickly or too rashly in a given situation. Sometimes situations call for quick action. I get that. But, um, you know, a lot of these answers, I mean, you see, you see Peter doing this. You don't really see the other disciples doing this like the way that he does. And this is something that we learn about him. Um, again, I mean, he has this great heart. And he was definitely a leader. It's evidence in the book of Acts and other places Peter was looked up to. He, got, he was able to get people to follow him. And, and he was definitely like a natural leader. And he did many, many great things. And it's interesting to see his, his quick reactions in these situations. Now, he, as we saw earlier, he did some really cool things like walking on water. He was ready to fight for Jesus. He cut off that ear of Malchus. 
But, I mean, he also rebuked Jesus. So this, this impulsiveness kind of has worked out, and, you know, I guess like in, in a couple different ways for him. Um, the last story we're going to look at is when Peter denied that he knew Jesus. Okay, and this is, this is a low point for Peter. If we're in Matthew, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter number 26. It's uh, right near the end of the book of Matthew. Matthew 26. We're going to see here in verse number 33. Let me start reading. It says, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men should be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Again, he's kind of saying things, you know, I'm never going to be offended. He's kind of just, just making a, a blanket statement. Though everybody else is offended of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him in verse 34, Verily I say unto thee, that this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Three times he's going to deny him. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. So everyone's saying, look, we're not going to deny you, Jesus. We're with you. We're with you to the end. And, um, and that's it. But look what happens in, uh, in verse number 56 of the same chapter, Matthew 26. Everybody said, look, we're not going to forsake you. We're not going to leave you. We're with you. Verse 56, But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Everybody left him. Just as Jesus said would happen. He said they, they all left. Verse 57, And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But look at verse 50, 58. It says, But Peter followed him afar off, unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. So the words in verse 58 are really interesting because it says that um, that same phrase is used in the other Gospels as well. The same exact phrase where it says Peter followed him afar off. In Mark 14, 54 it says and Peter followed him afar off even into the palace of the high priest and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Luke twenty two fifty four 54 says then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. I think it's important to note that that same phrase was used, that Peter was following afar off. Because we're going to see what happens when Peter, see he's still following Jesus. Now he fled, he ran away when they came to arrest him, but he still is following Jesus, yet he's following afar off. It says he wanted to see what the end would be. So he's not getting too close. I just want to follow and just kind of see how things are going to play out. Right? I'm just going to, I'm going to watch from back here. Let's see how that works out for him. Go ahead and turn it to, to Mark. I know I do in Matthew. Turn real quick to the book of Mark. It's just one book over. Mark chapter 14. Because we're going to see what happens here. How... how following a far off works out for Peter. Mark chapter number 14, right near the end, verse number 66. It says, the Bible reads, And as Peter was beneath in the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch and the cock crew. And a maid saw him again and began to say to them that stood by, This is one of them. And he denied it again. And a little after, they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. But he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom you speak. He denied him three times, just like Jesus again, as Jesus said he would. But Look at the lack of boldness. Now, this is the same Peter that just drew out his sword and cut off that servant's ear to, to defend Jesus, right? He had the boldness to do that. But when he did that, he was right next to Jesus. Jesus was right there with him. He had the boldness to pick up his sword and cut off that servant's right ear. When he's following afar off, he's way off, way away from Jesus, still following, but far off. He doesn't even have the boldness to say that he knows Jesus to a maid. And more than one, a maid, a maid in the Bible, okay, a maid is a young girl, it's a virgin. 
Okay, we're not talking even about a grown, like a, like a, I don't know, I mean, some, some higher up woman or something. When the Bible's talking about maid, we're talking about a young girl. A young girl confronts Peter, and he denies Jesus Christ to a young girl. He doesn't even have the boldness to say to a young girl, yeah, I am one of Jesus' disciples. Couldn't even do that. And it gets even worse. I mean, he does that twice. Both There's two maids here. And we see, I'm not even going to get into this, but the whole other sermon of itself, in the different accounts of the, of the gospel, with the cock crowing, Peter, Peter denied Jesus more than three times. It's clear. He denied him way more than three times. But we see in each of the accounts three of the times that he, that he denies Jesus. Two of the times here is to a maid. It's to, to a girl. But then... We don't know who it was to us because it was a group of people the third time in this, in this account that he, um, that he denies Jesus. But then it says, but he began to curse and to swear. So now you have someone who was, I mean, a disciple of Christ, following, doing the work. I mean, heavily involved with Jesus Christ, his whole ministry. I mean, this is at the end of Jesus Christ's ministry for three years. He followed Jesus Christ and he was doing all these great things. And I'm sure, I mean, he learned a lot. He, he was living righteously and doing his good things, but then he began to curse and to swear. This is what happens. If you say, well, I don't want to completely not follow Jesus, but I'm just going to follow afar off. You decide to follow afar off, you're not going to have the boldness that you need to do anything worth for anything. Your, your conversation, the, the words that you use, you might begin to curse and to swear. Look, if you... If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be a disciple, don't follow afar off. It's not going to get you anywhere. Get as close as you can to Jesus. Get right up there with him. Then you'll get that boldness. Hey, then you'll be able to do great things. You'll be willing to pull out your sword and, you know, and do whatever because you're going to be right there with him. When Jesus is afar off, you're just not going to have that strength. You're not going to have the boldness. How close are you to Jesus? Let's, let's work on getting closer to him. Now, after all the denials, it says in, in Luke, in Luke 22, 62, you have to turn, it says, And Peter went out and wept bitterly. He knew what happened. Jesus told him this was going to happen. Jesus told him he was going to deny him. I can't, it's hard to imagine how horrible he must have felt. Because he already said, I will, I will never, you know, leave you. That's not going to happen. I won't deny you. I'm with you to the end. Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times tonight. And then he did it. He thought about those things, and he saw Jesus too. Like right After this happened, Jesus looked on him. After, the, after he had denied him three times, and, and Peter went out and says he wept bitterly. Now, I've wept bitterly maybe once or twice in my life. Bitter weeping, that is, that is some serious, I mean, that's you're, when you're brought down really low. Some people, I don't even know if they've ever wept bitterly, but wait, that's, that, is, that is an extreme low point in your life. And, and um, you know, I don't wish on anyone, it's a horrible thing, to, I mean, just to be that sorrowful and that sad. But Peter went through this, so he, he hit this, I mean, he hit this low point where he, he realized, look, I just denied Jesus Christ. He is with him and serving with him, and he denied him three times. Very low point. Go ahead and turn to John chapter 21. I'm going to be wrapping things up here. This is the last story we're going to do. Um, John chapter number 21. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We started in John 1. We're going to finish in John 21. The last chapter of the book of John. Because, now of course, after, after this happens, after Peter denies Christ, you know, Jesus is crucified. He's buried, and then he's, he's resurrected again from the dead. And Peter's a witness of Jesus Christ after he was resurrected. Peter witnesses this. But this even he's even a witness of that before we get to this story in John chapter 21. Look at verse number 2. The Bible says there were, get, there were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Verse number four, but When the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto him, Children, have ye any meat? 
They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his, fisher, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Now does that story sound a little bit familiar from what we just saw in, um, in the beginning of the sermon? But, um, you know, Jesus had already told Peter, he said, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And this goes all the way back to where we started. When Peter was first became a disciple of Jesus, when he first decided to follow him, Jesus Christ said unto him, from henceforth, that means from now on, you're going to catch men. He was saying, you're done fishing for fish. You're done with that. They were not supposed to go back to their fishing jobs. Okay? Jesus had a different plan for them to do. You're going to go out and catch men. This is what I have for you to do. This is what I want you working on. But, as we see here in verse 3, it says, Simon Peter says, none of them, I go fishing. So he's, he's already just saying, no, you know, we're going to go back. And look what he does, too, because it wasn't just him that went. It was um, basically everyone else that's here went with him. Peter was a leader. He was able to lead people about. Now, as a leader, you could lead people to do good things, or you can lead people astray. And, and here he's kind of leading them just to go back out fishing. Is that what they were supposed to be doing? And his backsliding brought others with him. So you've got to watch out for that. Um, the people that you spend time with and the people that you're around. And you yourself. I mean, when you get into sin, when you get backslided, there's people that are going to be looking to you. Even if you don't realize that, you might not understand that. You might think, why would anyone in the world want to be looking at me as an example? But you know what? There might be somebody. Especially when there's kids around and stuff. You never know. I mean, kids get little get heroes. They get people that they like. You know, like people that come to church or whatever. That they just they like someone for whatever reason. And they look up to them. And you might not even realize it. You might have people that look up to you. And they're going to be watching you and looking at an example that you're setting. And um, it's important to know that because you can be part of dragging up. If you decide to get into sin and start backsliding, other people can look at that and, and you can bring them with you. And that's, that's not a good thing to do. Now, again, here we see a repeat of what happened when Jesus first called them to follow him, which is really cool. Because, um, you know, he asks them, hey, did you catch anything? Oh, we'll try it on the other side. Just like you told Peter, hey, let down your nets for a draft. Here he's telling them, okay, let your mix, and, and sure enough, Jesus tells them to do it, and, and of course, they get so many fish, you know, it's just a multitude of fish. They're not even able to pull it up out of the water into their boat because they get so many fish. And again, it's the same thing. They, they, were, they were out all night, and they didn't catch anything. Um, they, were, they were working all night, got nothing. And um, again, that's showing when they're, when they're doing the work in the flesh, and relying on their own strength and their own power to do this stuff, you're not going to catch anything. You're not going to do anything. But when you're listening and following the commands of Jesus, and Jesus is with you, hey, you can catch, you can do all kinds of great things if Jesus is blessing you. Now, um, and this is the last event too where we see this impulsive behavior by Peter, because Peter hears that it's Jesus. John, John realizes. John's in the boys and look. Okay, I remember what happened a few years ago. I remember when, when he told us to, to let the nets up. That's Jesus. That's Jesus on the shore that's, that's talking to us and telling us to let the net up. And the multitude of fish is like, there's no way. So when Peter hears that, he's just like, I'm not even going to wait for these boats to row in the shore. He just jumps right in the water and, and swims the shore. Now, um, and that's just I think that's one more thing where he's just like, oh, it's Jesus, boom, I'm there. And um, it's also important to note here that, that the Bible says that he was naked. And it's not in there by accident. It's not just some little detail that just like, that's there for no reason. Right? There'd be no reason to say it if it wasn't there for a reason. And Because it says he girt on his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and he cast himself into the sea. And we'll, you'll see throughout the Bible many places that that basically being naked is a sign of, of, you know, when you're ashamed and when you're in sin. Um, the Bible correlates that with being naked. Peter was in sin here. Peter was backslidden. 
and basically he was naked and open. And I'm not going to get into that very much, but um, it's definitely not their accent. Now, Jesus had a conversation with Peter in chapter 21 here. We're going to see, they get to shore, they see Jesus Christ, they know it's him, and Jesus has this conversation with Peter. I'll close with this. In verse number 15, he says, So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again, the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And I think it's, it's, it's important to note that here too. Jesus asked him three times if he loved him. And that grieves me. The third time he said it, it really just kind of stuck Peter in the heart and just said, you know, ouch. He just asked me three times if I love him. And how many times did Peter deny him? Three times. Peter denied Jesus Christ three times. And Jesus came back and he asked him three times, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? He said, look, you know I love you. The third time, though, it really sucked. It grieved him. But you know what? Sometimes, sometimes you need to hear that. Sometimes you need to hear God's word to pierce your heart. And, and you can say, look, God, you know I love you. But sometimes you need to be reminded of, of some of the things you've done so that you can fix them going forward. It wasn't, Peter, Jesus wasn't saying that to him just because he hated him. Jesus loved him. Jesus definitely loved him. But he's saying, look, I want you to get right. I want you to stop this backside. I want you to get back on track. And after this, we see Peter does. He gets right back into the swing of things, and he gets on fire for serving God probably more than he ever was. And he ends up being martyred for the cause of Christ. He ends up, you know, giving up his life and not denying Jesus in the end. Even someone like Peter can backslide. Peter was a great man of God. We're not going to take anything away from that. He did a lot of great things. He was a very close disciple of Jesus's, and he did many wonderful things, but he still backslid. He still had that happen. So whatever you do, whatever you do, if you backslide, don't let that take you out of the race for serving God. You may face a setback in your life. Don't quit. Don't quit. Peter could have quit at this point. I mean, he was, he was pretty much on that course of quitting when he, when he started up fishing again and doing this stuff. But hey, Jesus called him back. He said, look, I want you, I meant what I said when I want you to be a fisher of men. I want you to keep doing that. Don't let these setbacks get you out. Don't let, don't let that make you quit. Jesus, or Peter went on to do amazing things as we're seeing in the book of Acts. I mean, he was healing people. People were coming. I mean, he was doing so many things for the glory of God after all of this happened. Whatever has happened in your life, you, can, you don't know what's in store in front of you. Don't let the past bring you back down. Peter's an extremely interesting character. He definitely had a great heart. He was a little impulsive, as we saw, but another thing that you may notice is that in this, you might ask, I didn't really get into this a whole lot, but he asked, Peter, he asked Jesus a lot of questions. And that's a, I think that's a good thing. He's, he's, he wants to know more about Jesus. He's asking a lot of stuff. He had many great attributes and many great acts. Let's try to learn from his strong qualities as well as from his weak qualities. You know, not, not to be so impulsive, not to be quick to speak, not to spout off the mouth real fast and quick to answer, but um, slow to speak and slow to wrath, like the Bible says. Take things in. Be, be careful with the things that you say. And um, again, I mean, Peter had a really low point, yet that didn't knock him out of the race, and Jesus wasn't done with him yet. Even though he had that problem, Jesus was not done using him. So let's, um, let's say focus on serving Jesus. Let's learn from Peter. The Apostle Peter is an amazing character in the Bible. And um, hopefully you all were able to pick up a little bit of something here.
and um, and we're able to, to learn more and, and we can apply that in, in our lives. So let's let's bow our heads and pray.